The federal government's Your Future, Your Super Bill, which passed Parliament in June, is the latest in a long line of reforms aimed at reining in Australia's woefully high superannuation costs. But how many of us really understand whether our super fund is performing well or not? Thankfully, I have two experts here today to discuss what the new super reforms mean for everyday Australians. With me is Brendan Coates, Economic Policy Program Director at Grattan. Welcome, Brendan. Hi, Kat. And in what I think might be a Grattan first, we have a special guest in Xavier O'Halloran, who is the Director of Super Consumers Australia, which is an independent consumer advocacy group in the superannuation sector. Welcome, Xavier. Thanks for having me. So, Brendan, I always like to start with a little bit of context. Why are super fees so high in Australia? And why do so many underperforming funds exist? Yeah, well, Kat, it is a big problem. It's something that Grattan and others have been trying to deal with for a long period of time. But, you know, in short, Australians are paying, you know, something like $30 billion a year in superannuation fees. That's pretty close to 2% of um, Australia's GDP. And it is on average a lot higher than what we see in a lot of comparable countries. And it's more than what we spend each year on energy bills. And so that gives you a sense of like just how much money is going into managing our superannuation savings. Now, the reasons why they're, you know, the fees are so high is because there are too many funds. You know, we've got something like 6 million on multiple accounts and, you know, 3 million members languishing in seriously underperforming funds. So the reason why this situation has come to exist is because, you know, there's little competition between members for funds. So there's plenty of players in the current system. The problem is they're just not competing very hard. So before performance doesn't lead you to lose many members uh, and neither does outperformance lead you to gain many members. And that competition doesn't exist because super, fund, super funds themselves and their members don't exercise informed choice. So Australians aren't informed about the you know, their costs they're paying. It's hard for them to weigh up with what is a good fund and what is not. And they don't really switch funds very often. And so you shouldn't be surprised that the outcome is, is underperformance. And if you step back and think about it sort of from conceptually, you know, the whole point of superannuation is about getting people, particularly compulsory super, is quite reasonably, it's about getting people to save for the long term because they won't think about it themselves. There's behavioural biases, they won't think about it. The main emotion people have associated with superannuation is often fear because there's fear of the unknown of what retirement is. Are they going to save enough? Um, and financial literacy is low. So the original sin almost built into the system that we've been working to fix for the last you know, a few years, is that we built a system that's about making people do something they won't naturally do themselves. And then the way we've set that system up is people have to make informed choices about what fund they're going to be in when it's really hard to compare which fund with which. And, you know, where people's understanding of finance is pretty low. And so, frankly, we shouldn't be surprised that we've ended up in this situation in the first place. And so you can see that in the Productivity Commission work that was done a couple of years ago, which in turn, incidentally, was sort of informed by Grattan's work on this back in 2014 and 2015, is that there's a long tail of underperforming funds. So funds that are typically charging quite high fees, because fees do tend to correlate with underperformance. Uh, so people are not getting as high returns on their superannuation savings as they should. Um, and that long tail of funds has persisted for a long time. And so basically, without government action, you're not going to see the bar being lifted on those underperforming funds. And the difference for the average Australian, you know, between being in a good fund and being in a, frankly, a pretty crappy fund is, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in superannuation balances by the time they retire. Yeah. And I remember the one time I finally figured out how to check whether my super fund was performing well or not was actually reading The Barefoot Investor. And for someone who's, you know, as old as I am, I should have known earlier how to check my super fund. So, Brendan, I really want to know how these new underperformance tests will work. So the, the legislation has a few different parts. And so we'll talk about the underperformance test first, and I think we'll talk about some of the other measures later. So the, so the centrepiece of the, the reform is essentially this new underperformance test that will, will benchmark members um, you know, against sort of a, a a return based on the underlying assets that sit inside that 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 super fund, that or those that products uh, the, the investment exposures that it's exposed to. So, you know, if you're twenty percent invested in domestic equities, it'll be benchmarked against you know an index fund of twenty percent of domestic equities. If you've got ten percent in listed infrastructure assets, it'll be benchmarked against that. So it basically allows you know APRA. Um, which will administer this underperformance test to assess how well funds are doing compared to controlling for the kind of assets that super funds 
um, and products are, are invested in. And what basically will happen is if a product uh, falls at least 0.5% uh, below um, this net return, re investment return benchmark, so returns net of fees, investment fees and admin fees over an eight-year period, then um, they'll have to notify their members uh, that they're an underperforming fund and they've been flagged by that by APRA, so that's a requirement of the law. And then if they fail it two years in a row, you know, then essentially they won't be allowed to take new members um, until their performance improves. Um, and so this is something that was recommended by the Productivity Commission when it did the work a couple of years ago. There's been a sense in which the government or in the media narrative around this set of reforms has been very much about the super wars, you know, industry funds, which are typically supported by labor. And, you know, there are business groups on the boards of those funds. They are often described in the media as being union backed funds, which is not quite right. And then you've got historically the liberal side of politics has normally supported the, um, the retail funds. And it's been seen in the media as being, you know, to a degree, a sort of a fight between those two groups. But underpinning it all is literally a Productivity Commission recommendation that we need to fix this problem uh, that the government has then, has then enacted. Um, so in practice, what's probably going to happen is that the industry funds, which do tend to perform better on average, are probably going to outperform their retail peers and they're likely to win from these reforms. You know, there's been certainly some concerns that um, it'll lead to more passive management. So instead of, um, you know, you employ you know, finance sector types to basically invest the money and actively choose what stocks you're going to be invested in or, or whatnot, that it'll shift people towards passive investments where you just track the index. We tend to think that's probably a good idea because that is, you know, our 2015 report super savings tended to find that few asset managers outperform their fears over time. And so, you know, what these reforms should do is they'll force funds into um, lifting their performance if they're at the bottom of the of the bottom of the pile, and the the way that they will probably do that, the easiest way to improve your performance is to lower your fees, because uh, it's the thing you can do straight away. Uh, and some of the fees charged by these funds are really high, and so the net effect of these reforms will be lower fees and therefore higher returns for consumers. I do want to go to you, Xavier, about this idea of coverage and kind of maybe you can touch on some of these concerns that have been raised by labour and the super industry that it doesn't cover all the super funds. Yeah, so that's right. The first stage, um, my super products will be picked up by the test so for the first year. So that's the kind of fund that people are defaulted into most. It's meant to be a pretty simple, relatively low-cost product that's um, – appropriate for most Australians. So I think it's important. That's where they started um, doing this testing and that's where they had the data to actually test them. So that was where they're always going to start, I guess. Um, very quickly, they're going to start to pick up something that they're calling trustee directed products. And this is basically just a broader group of um, investment options that people for the most part would have selected and um, chosen to go into. Now, there's some few exceptions around the edges though here. Um, of options that won't get picked up. And they're things like if um, the investment option is set up in a way that actually the individual takes a bit more of an active role in selecting um, the investment within that investment option. So we're talking about here like people that are on a platform and might be choosing a number of managed um, funds that they put their superannuation savings into. Um, that kind of thing would be carved out. That's not great from our perspective. A lot of people end up in these products um, through financial advice. Um, they tend to be quite expensive products from our view as well. Often you'll get charged a whole bunch of fees simply to access the platform in order to invest on, which um, consumers probably aren't always factoring into their overall costs for taking up that type of option. Um, so we've been really encouraging the government to look at creative ways to deal with that problem. For example, presenting back um, benchmarks to the actual consumers to see how they're tracking against um, similar APRA benchmarks. So they give them a bit of an idea of how they're going and whether that financial advice that they got to go into that product is actually appropriate uh, ultimately. Um, and the other really big area that's carved out, probably the, the majority of um, investment options that won't be covered by the test in the first stage. And at the moment, there's not actually an intention to pick them up. So this is a really crucial area. And that's um, the, the retirement phase. So when people are drawing down their money, um, they're still invested in the market. Um, and often those investments look quite similar to the accumulation stage. Uh, the real barriers there, though, is unfortunately that the regulator hasn't been collecting data on the performance of these um, investment options, which uh, is going to be really crucial going forward. The plan is that they will start collecting that information. So we'll have an idea of 
um, who's underperforming and who's not, which is a good starting point. Um, then I guess they have to consider, well, what's the appropriate way to deal with the problem if we do, in fact, find one? We've got you know, a group of older Australians who might have um, you know, linked products which are harder to get out of. Some of these retirement phase products aren't really designed to be left once you're in them. Um, some definitely are, and I think that they're, um, they can be tested in the same way. And you've also got a group of people that, you know, you probably don't want to send massive shock waves through that portion of the community that, you know, the, the money that they're living off right now is in an underperforming fund. You've got to be quite careful about that communication. I think it's ultimately important that they know um, that, they, that there are clear options for them to um, make changes. But I think we need to think through exactly how we go about that without the data and having a picture of the size and scope of the problem. Um, we can't do that right now, unfortunately. So there's some pretty valid, I think, criticism around um, what needs to be expanded in this space. Suppose, Davey, that the challenge here, right, was that if you've choices between you've got a fund set of funds that you can identify are underperformers now and then a fund set of funds that you don't have the data on to, to identify now, what do you do? And, you know, I think the government's made the right call at the moment that, you know, if you can identify underperforming funds now, it's incumbent upon government to to include them in the test and to sort of start the test now, um, so that you're actually at least fixing that problem that exists for those underperforming funds you can identify. But you definitely need to look at trying to expand it over time. So Treasury's been they're trying to they're consulting on how to expand the coverage to some of the missing funds now. I think they've got a report back by what one July twenty twenty two. So we've got a year. Um, it does raise questions of whether you actually ever get all those funds in the test. Like, can this sort of test deal with the tail of, of, of funds where it's sort of harder to compare because people are exercising more choice? And once people are sort of making exercise in their own choice, is it the fund that's really accountable for um, those choices and the outcomes, like comparing it against some benchmark? Or is it the individual themselves that's pro you're probably at the point where a fund would be being punished for the choices being made by the members themselves? It's really just important to give people that information, though, particularly if they have been, um, you know, advised into those products and may not actually be that kind of sophisticated investors are just really acting on the advice of others because um, we know the financial advice sector has had its issues. Um, and this is probably a good way for it, it to be checked. You know, is that advice quality? Are they giving good quality advice? And um, if they are, th these types of tests could really show that. And yeah, you raise a really interesting point and something that I'd been wondering about is, you know, are people just going to get a letter that says you, you're in an underperforming fund and just something that, you know, okay, well, what do I do about that? Like how do we enable people to have the tools to make really positive financial choices for their future? And I think that's something we'll probably get into in a tick, I reckon. So one of the things that has come out of the new laws is that from the 1st of November, you'll keep your existing super funds staple to you when you switch jobs, which is clearly a metaphorical staple, not a literal staple. What will this mean for Australians, Xavier? Yeah, it's not a great term, is it? I think we've got um, Commissioner Kenneth Hayne to blame for that one um, as he recommended it in the Banking Royal Commission report. But what it um, practically means is going forward, uh, in the past, a lot of people didn't really actively choose who their super fund was. So if they changed jobs, they'd end up with the default fund of their new employer. And as Brendan mentioned earlier, that led to the creation of millions of duplicate accounts in the system, very costly, adding to you know, lots of fees coming out, lots of extra insurance premiums, sometimes in cases where they couldn't even claim on that extra insurance. So a lot of unnecessary costs in the system. But going forward, what will happen is basically your employer will have to contact the ATO and find out what your stapled fund is. And link that fund to you going forward. So that fund will then follow you from job to job in future. So you won't be creating these extra accounts. Um, there's been quite a bit of confusion in the debate, and I think partly because of the way this legislation um, rolled out and was debated in public, that maybe you can't choose your own fund um, once you're stapled to a fund. That's not the case. You can, you can still choose your own fund. You won't be stapled to a, you know, a bad fund for the rest of your life and you can never change it and everything. Um, do include you can definitely switch um, funds that's really important in terms of the way the ato decides what your stapled fund is at the moment they've got a, basically a set of rules that they've got to follow at a very high level it's you know what your most active fund most recently has been um, that's the fund that you're likely to carry through 
that we'd really encourage people to look at what that is. Um, and it, that's about to get a lot easier as well, as we're going to discuss soon, um, to make sure that that fund's actually a fund. So, Xavier, won't Australians lose access to their default insurance because of this stapling? So this is another really confusing thing that came out in the debate as well. There were some commentators that saying people would get stapled to a fund that had insurance that they could claim on going forward. So super consumers did some research to try and understand this issue a little bit better. We've got a sample of a lot of the insurance policies, about 75% of the market. So we went through them to see if these types of exclusions existed. And they do. In some funds, we found about seven where, um, for example, if you entered the workforce with a superannuation fund um, and then transferred into another higher risk occupation later and your super came with you, your insurance policy would no longer cover in the same way that new occupation. So often it was examples where, say, a younger person might have entered the workforce um, then in a relatively low risk job and then gone into, say, construction and found that um, their insurance policy no longer protected them. So that's something that's obviously really concerning. We get some of the good things we found in our research, though, it wasn't any of the um, kind of default funds for that are typically covering new workplace entrants that um, seem to have these types of exclusions. They're mostly kind of large retail funds um, that, that had them. We also wrote to all of those funds and said, hey, I think this is a very good idea. You're offering insurance that, you know, even at the moment, you might have some members that are working in, you know, construction and things like that. And you're charging them for cover, which they might not be able to claim on. So quite a few of them got back to us and said, yeah, they kind of agree. They're getting rid of these terms now. They're all dealing with it in different ways, though. Some are dealing, going to get rid of it for new members but not existing. Some are getting rid of it altogether. Um, so it's a bit of a mess at the moment. And this is another area that the government through um, the legislative process decided that we're going to review as well to see how big a problem is this and what are the right ways to solve it. During the debate, we thought I probably could have just dealt with it and said, you know, you can't be stapled to a fund that has these types of occupational exclusions. Um, given we found so few of them, we thought the price impact of that was probably going to be pretty minimal if they all decided to dump them. And we know that a lot of funds don't have them and they're still able to offer an affordable insurance product out there. So um, they decided not to do that. But um, going forward, I guess we'll be drawing a lot more attention to where these gaps are because we think they, they really do need to be dealt with so that people aren't paying for carbon that they can't claim on ultimately. There is kind of a broader question here, right, that, you know, should, should funds – that are open offer funds that are taking people from any that are advertised and take people from the community. And, you know, the history of this is, you know, soup default soup was normally linked to the, you know, the award um, that, you know, there was a, there was an industry fund for each sort of occupation broad. So you had CBAS is like the construction industry one. And so, you know, construction is a riskier job. You're spending a lot of time up on scaffolds and in buildings and therefore you need more insurance uh, because, you know, there's greater risks. We're in a world now, right, where, you know, CBUS is advertising on the footy and, you know, so it's not just taking people from, you know, from the construction industry in the same way as other funds that are advertising openly in order to secure members who might be working in those riskier occupations. Um, so it does raise the question why we even have these exclusions at all. It just seems to me the answer is probably just get rid of them. Um, you know, one of the claims that's been made is that if you, increase the number of like if you if you drop these exclusions then you will like raise insurance costs i wasn't i'll be honest with you i'm not convinced that that's true because the insurable risks relate to the jobs that people do so like you know there's a certain number of people in australia that work in jobs that they're likely to is potentially fall from 10 meters or above that is not a, a risk that i'm exposed to as a as a think tanker um on a daily basis and therefore you know, if I change jobs, it's not going to change the amount of costs an insurance company to really insure me. Um, so it strikes me just the way forward with this, you know, hopefully for me, my view is out, out of the review, we'll, out of the Treasury's doing, we'll, we'll just drop those exclusions, that they won't exist anymore, that you cannot have those exclusions because they're very costly because they erode confidence in the system. If you don't know whether your insurance will actually cover you, it's like if you had house insurance, home and contents insurance, and there's like a one in 10 chance that it just won't cover you for you know, your house has a fire. That's that's a really bad situation to be in. If people are underinsured, it, it generates all sorts of anxieties in their lives. 
So, Xavier, one of the tools that the government has released alongside these new changes is a tool called Your Super, and we'll put a link to this in the show notes. How effective do you think this comparison tool will be? Yeah, this is the big unknown. Historically, engagement hasn't really worked in superannuation too well, um, and that's for a whole range of reasons from, you know, the biases that we have as human beings and not focusing too much on the future, things that are out of sight tend to be out of mind, right through to the funds really not doing much of an effort to show in a really comparable, easy way how they perform. Um, if you go to a lot of fund comparisons at the moment, they're you're comparing on pretty subjective measures a lot of the time. Um, this tool is really designed to get away from all of that and provide for the first time a really good independent source of information. Um, what's actually going to be valuable about it is interesting to unpack because there's a few different elements that uh, make up this tool. So at the moment, it compares all the MySuper products, those basic default products. Um, by default, it shows you how they all perform based on a dollar fee, um, which is you know, a, a relatively good way for consumers to weigh up um, how a fund might go into the future. Fees are something that you know, the funds can control. They can't really control future performance. Um, it does tell you what the net investment returns are, so you have an idea about historical returns, net of fees in there. So that gives you some guide over the long term what their recent history has been like. Um, but, you know, as the ads always say, past performance is not a reliable indicator of future performance. Um, but the really key piece of information in this that I think most people are going to find really valuable is it will tell you whether your fund is underperforming or not. And of, I think, the 88 products that are in the comparison tool at the moment, there's a kind of expectation that probably about 23 of them might fall into this underperforming category. That's going to be crucial information to people. The Productivity Commission modelling found that if you get people out of those underperformers, that kind of bottom quartile, even if you move them up one quartile, that's something like $180,000 improvement in their retirement outcome. So that's massive. If, if we only get that value out of a tool like this for the people that use it, that's quite a significant change for those individuals. I'm still a little circumspect about how um, broad the impact will be, and I think the, the tool has scope to improve over time so that more people are using it and it's more in front of people and becomes just part of um, their habit of checking it at appropriate times. Um, so, you know, a little bit of caution around how big an impact it will have. But I think for those that are engaged, this is going to be a bit of a game changer. I would certainly look at the underperformance test as being sort of the thing that's going to do the most work. Um, and Kat, you raised it before on the, uh, you know, what happens if you get a letter that says you're in an underperforming fund? Like we know that engagement with super is not high. So maybe that letter is not enough to get you to, 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 to shift. You know, you got to remember, you've also got an APRA as the regulatory cop on the beat. And so if a fund is flagged as being underperforming for two years in a row and they can't take new members, APRA has a whole bunch of other tools at its disposal to sort of like ask whether a fund is actually, you know, operating in the best interest of its members it can look at like whether a fund should be wound up. Um, like these tools exist and they've probably been a bit, well, it's pretty clear from the Royal Commission. That was one of the key findings of the Royal Commission is that, you know, APRA was 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 probably too focused on making sure the system didn't fall over. So to make sure that, you know, that our funds didn't go bankrupt, which is important and probably not so focused on whether funds are um, performing well. So, you know, if you're in an underperforming fund that wasn't going to go bankrupt because it was charging its members a lot of money, that was not a problem. Uh, where it's clearly is a huge problem as Xavier's sort of um, canvassed. And so I suspect what we'll see is a lot of mergers um, and that will be how funds will deal with being an underperformer. You, you'll probably see them merge because there's also, you know, if you've been listed as a prior in your industry, You've got to justify to your members and to the public why you as a fund should continue to offer a subpar of returns to your members. And the argument being, oh, well, you know, we we somehow service like a very narrow slice of the of workers in one part of the industrial relations system is just not going to cut it going forward. And similarly, if you're a retail fund, um, you know, you're going to find yourself pretty well cornered. So I suspect you'll see a lot of mergers out of this and that'll actually, that scale is you know, the thing that's probably going to drive down costs because, you know, this is a fixed returns game. So 
you get constant re- you get increasing returns to scale as soon as you get that then you know the cost will fall yeah that merger um, piece is really interesting we're actually already seeing it some of the funds that we've been mapping as being underperformers we're seeing even in the last couple of weeks announcing mergers with bigger good performing funds um, so that the, clearly the impact of this is already starting to track we also tracked a lot of the um, mergers over the last two years to see you know, if the, this understanding that scale was going to lead to better outcomes for members and it held up over the last two years, fees dropped by a greater degree amongst those merge funds than they did across the rest of the market. So, yeah, scale is a thing <laughs> and it's on display in the superannuation market at the moment. Yeah, I think there's two really crucial points here, and, and that is that the law is working effectively, but also there's a public communications exercise here, which is people don't know enough about superannuation and how they can make good choices here. And so there is a government um, kind of onus to promote these tools, like the, the comparison tools, so that people actually know they exist and also the choices they have after finding out about underperforming funds. But I'm I'm certainly just going back to that point on the website is that if, if there's a website that I can go to for five minutes and compare some super funds and find out I can, you know, eventually have $180,000 more in my super fund at retirement, I mean, why wouldn't you do that? I mean, I think that's a pretty good investment of your time to check that. I want to touch now on something that you were just talking about and kind of just touching on, which was this idea that the law now strengthens the requirement to work in the best interests of members. But what does that actually mean, Xavier? Yeah, so the the change in this legislation is um, came about because there were recommendations in a few reports around the real lack of focus on what the financial interests of members um, are in the superannuation sector. So previously it just said, you know, you have to act in the best interest of the members. Um, people kind of understood that at a high level. Um, this is just really about making it a lot clearer. So they've inserted financial into the test. So it's, you have to act in the best financial interests in a kind of practical legal sense. It's kind of always how the courts interpreted it. But this is more for superannuation funds to get a better understanding of what that their focus should actually be. So um, what it does is it'll bring into question a whole bunch of expenditure, which is not directly linked to financial interests. So, you know, if there are big marketing campaigns, um, which there are clear links between how they'll improve the finances of the super funds. They've tried to defend them in some ways by saying, you know, if they attract more members or keep their members, they have scale and um, there's obviously benefits from that. Um, but it is a bit of a zero-sum game in this industry. They're taking measures from others sometimes. So, um, And then some of the advertising we've probably seen over the last few years hasn't been as directed at um, kind of retaining or attracting members. It's um, sometimes straight into kind of broader um, political and social issues, which might be outside of this best financial interest duty. Um, then you look at, you know, maybe smaller things, but I think they're telling. Um, I get invited to a, a lot of industry conferences and things like that. Um, you know, I've worked in other industries before as well. This is clearly the most extravagantly <laughs> set up conferences I've seen out of any industry I've worked in. You know, you'll have big name Australian artists performing at their kind of conference dinners and things like that. Um, you know, these people are the custodians for Australia's retirement savings and for some very, you know, low income people as well, right through the spectrum. Is it appropriate that they're spending that much money on things like this? But they're also very well represented in a lobbying sense um, sector. They've got four major industry lobbies funded to about the tune of $10 million each a year. That's all members' money that goes into that kind of thing. Um, so I think part of this test is really to put to the test. Are these um, expenditures in the best interest of members uh, longer term, best financial interests? Because I think there's some pretty big question marks over them. And at the very least, um, having to apply that kind of rigor to, and question marks for the, on the part of the trustees about funding lobby groups that much, spending that much on advertising, I think we'll create a better discipline in the industry about what they do spend money on. My all-time favourite um, industry, uh, super industry conference stories are um, when Buzz Aldrin came and uh, presented to the ASFA conference a couple of years ago and uh, when they had a hologram of Kevin Spacey doing a pre-recorded video. 
And, you know, it is hard. I don't, I'll confess, Xavier, I don't get those invites as much. I think um, our work on the SG has probably, um, probably meant those invites have dried up, uh, which isn't a bad thing. Um, but you know, you do, you, you do look at the, some of the expenses in the sector and, you know, it's consistent with a world where the, the fees are too high. You know, there's, there's a lot of money sloshing around that, you know, you've got to wonder if that's really the best in, in, in members, best financial interests. So just to wrap up, uh, with both of you, um, I'll get you both of your thoughts on this, but is this the end game when it comes to fixing super? And if not, what should governments do next? So Brendan, I'll start with you. Well, um, Kat, look, I kind of think of this, I sort of channel Chairman Mao and like the long march. I think we're kind of like halfway there. I, I, th I genuinely think, you know, we started this process about five years ago where before that, you know, people, you know, even, even Treasury government was not thinking very much about superannuation costs. Um, they weren't th really thinking about the market very much at all. Um, it really, you know, it really did start with Grattan's work, um, sort of showing that the size of the problem that was there and the sort of, by definition, the size of the potential productivity gains, because if you can do, if you can get the same outcome for less money, that is the very definition of a, of a productivity improvement. Now, the, you know, government has a responsibility to get this right, because we are mandating that people save 10% of their income. Maybe it goes to 12, we'll see, um, of their, of their wages into superannuation each year. And then we've set it up in a system where people have got to choose what product they're in uh, and they're making those choices has historically been really hard. So, you know, I think what's missing here is the government's, like the underperformance test deals with the bottom. The stapling deals with the multiple accounts. You know, the, the financial interest side of things makes sure that the regulator is going to be on the beat and doing its job. What's missing is what is the incentive for a median fund? So an average fund that's not an underperformer to lift their game because they're clearly still a fair way from the kind of world we want to be in. The, the, the fees still appear too high um, and therefore they're still fat in the system we should take out. And the issue is really that, you know, at the moment they're, they're, there's no incentive for that individual fund at the median. And so there's kind of two ways you could go about it from here, both of which are, you know, fairly big bang reforms. One is to, 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 to implement what the, the government has not done from the Productivity Commission report, which is best in show. This is essentially changing the way that default funds are selected in the first place. So instead of individuals being defaulted into a fund from based on the award that they're in or who their employer chooses for them, uh, instead, you know, the government would um, present people with a list of top, top 10 funds or top five or top 20. It doesn't really matter the size of that, of that cohort and basically says, you can select one of these funds if you want to. That's what we recommend. You can choose another fund if you want. And that list of top 10 funds is put together by basically funds tendering or bidding to be on this, this short list. And then you would have independent panel that would choose what funds go onto the short list based on sort of fees, returns, all this sort of stuff. Uh, and you get composition at the wholesale level. So individuals can't exercise informed choice. Or I'm very skeptical that most individuals will exercise informed choice. And so what this would do is it would force that choice to come about at the wholesale level as funds try to get on that list. And if they, you could particularly deal with the question of the back book, because obviously only there's only a billion dollars of new default money from new workers coming into the system each year. But there are $2 trillion sitting in APRA regulated funds now. Um, you know, my money, your money, the, everyone's money that's been accumulated to this point. And you could actually get competition on that side by forcing funds to require to, that bid for the top 10 list, which is very lucrative over time, to because you are stapled to that fund for life, essentially, unless you choose not to be, to then offer that same deal to their back book of existing members and you could raise, you could improve the whole system. The alternative um, is a single national default fund. Um, you know, Sweden operates such a single national default, you get economies of scale by essentially you know, having a single default, which has all those um, all those default members basically channeled into that fund, uh, they can obviously choose a different fund. It probably gives the government, it probably gives consumers greater confidence they're going to be in a reasonable fund because you know it's a government um, supported one. Um, and you could easily imagine it would cost a lot less than the current system. You know, if you do have a government fund, I think the big biggest benefit from that kind of reform, if the government went down that path, is it solves the problem with the drawdown phase. So we've been talking so far about accumulation. So, you know, you put money in, you compound into returns over time. That That's a pretty simple process, even though we all find it pretty hard to choose a fund or a lot of Australians clearly choose badly. 
Um, that's pretty straightforward. You know, you can get out of your fund at any point in time. It's all about just making sure in a, a fund with like, you know, broad diversified returns um, when low fees, that's a pretty simple game. The drawdown phase, when people are starting to spend their money, uh, when there's all these products available, annuities, so you get a fixed income stream for life, all these things, they're a lot more complex. I find them harder to explain to my parents who are at that point. Um, and as Xavier alluded to, they're often a one-shot game. Like once you've chosen the fund, you're in for basically for life. And if you choose badly at that point, then it has big implications for you potentially. And so a, one benefit of a government fund, if they did go down that path, is essentially you can solve that problem at the same time by the government offering those kind of products, um, which I, I tend to think there's a pretty good case for that happening anyway. Um, the, the, the downsides of a, of a government-run fund uh, would be, look, you're, you are basically cutting all the existing funds out of the default market. That's a big step to take. Um, it's not an unjustified step in my view if government went there, uh, but it would have the effect of basically cutting off the existing funds from new default members. They would have to compete for them. Um, the other argument that's been put against it is for the Productivity Commission said, oh, if, the, if a government fund underperformed, uh, the government would be on the hook to boost up the returns. I tend to think that's not the case because they're already on the hook for the age pension. Now, I'm aware we're keenly running out of time, but super is such a complex issue that we did take some time to get into it. Xavier, I still want to hear your thoughts on, on what's your end game for super and what should governments do next? Yeah, it's pretty similar to Brendan, to be honest. Um, the default system at the moment is not a meritocracy. Uh, I think the Productivity Commission called it an unlucky lottery. Um, people can end up in any kind of fund as a default at the moment. So they need to address that. And yeah, those two options that Brendan just uh, went through in detail then, I think are the two main contenders at the moment. Um, they've both got their strengths and weaknesses. I think a, a bit more probably needs to be done on both of them, although obviously the Productivity Commission put a lot more effort into expanding on what Best in Show could deliver um, to members. So if we did go down that um, government path, I think there would be a need for a bit more work um, done there. But obviously the, the biggest benefit from that model is scale, um, and it's pretty hard to display some of those scale benefits um, with other options, particularly in this market. Uh, the other thing I'd add, though, I think in the in the interim, before we move to that stage, we're going to learn a lot about what the limits of consumer engagement are and what benefits we can kind of derive from it. Because I think in the past, people have said, oh, if only we had somewhere for people who could get funds to solve all these problems. We're going to have that now. So we're going to see how much change we can actually drive and whether we'll get enough good outcomes to improve the market sufficiently. Uh, as I said before, I'm pretty circumspect about how far it will go, but I, I think it's important that we at least observe it in, in the meantime. And then that final point, um, Brendan picked up on as well, the retirement phase. There is so much work to be done here. The government's going to um, launch a consultation pretty shortly on the retirement covenant and a whole range of factors around how um, super funds are designing products, uh, what their strategy is, how we actually give proper guidance to people to find appropriate products. And then that really important piece for people that don't engage, what are the kind of soft defaults that are built into the system? Because the way it's looking, they're not going for a really hard default system um, in the retirement phase. There's a lot of debate over whether that's a great idea given that, you know, these are difficult products to engage with. You're talking about an age population um, making really big, potentially, you know, decisions that they can't take back either with some of the products that we're looking at, um, that's going to be a huge piece for us to figure out and try and get right. So um, it's going to be a really important time I think, over the next 12 months and assessing how far we've come and whether those gains have been successful and where to next, particularly for that retirement phase. Thanks, Xavier. And before I wrap up, where can our listeners find you and your team's research into super? Yeah, on our website, which is superconsumers.com.au, we've got a, a blog with a lot of our original research there. Thank you so much, Xavier and Brendan. That has been an excellent in-depth conversation into the new super changes. Um, if you're interested in finding out more about our own research into super, including some of the reports that Brendan has mentioned, you can get them for free on our website at grattan.edu.au. As always, you can find us on social media and continue the 
conversation with us at Grattan Inst on Twitter and Grattan Institute on all other social media channels. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please hit follow on your favorite podcasting app. We really appreciate it. And give us a rating or review. As always, we always say take care and thank you so much for listening.